Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the worship service. Good to see you. Let's stand together as we uh, open our hearts to God's presence with us this morning, uh, lifting our voices, maybe lifting our hands or clapping, whatever it may be doing, uh, may it be for God's glory together today. Clapping going on. You can do it. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes a whole earth with holy thunder? Leaves us breathless in all in wonder. The King of glory, the King above the King. This is amazing grace. This is a very love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life.
God, will you help us to be people that are, are pure in heart, are faithful to you in spirit, and that just, in a sense, live clean lives. And God, amongst the, the filth and the muck and the dangers of this world, you make us clean, you make us pure. And so I ask that we would not only sing out to you, but take these moments to allow our lives to be rededicated to you, Jesus. Be 
fix our eyes on you. You are all we want, God. We want more of you. You open up our hearts. We fix our eyes on you. You are all we want, God. We want more of you. You open up our hearts. We fix our eyes. Amen. May that be the prayer of our hearts, uh, just that God's presence and spirit would move in us. We would sense it, feel it, see it. Even in those moments when we don't, that we would just have faith of, you know, God is real, God is present within us. Um, and just that our, our, really our, truly our one desire in our life would just to kind of be with and be like Jesus. Uh, amen. Thank you so much, church. You may be seated. Well, I just want to take this moment and uh, welcome you this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, would you be so kind to grab the Connect card that you can find right in the pew in front of you or the inside part of your bulletin? And please fill that out. You can uh, turn it in the offering plate when it comes by in just a few minutes. Uh, or you can put it in one of the drop boxes in the lobby. So please do that. One of our pastors will follow up with you, welcome you, see if you have any questions. So we want to welcome you if you're visiting. Um, I want to also take a moment to introduce our, our guest group. Some of the folks from the uh, Amherst College Gospel Choir are here this morning. So let's welcome them. Woo! So as they uh, find their way and, and kind of get set up, I'll invite Desiree to come and lead us in uh, prayer this morning to prepare for our offering. Good morning, church. Please join me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, and we pray that others who need your blessings may also be blessed. We pray, dear Father God, that we may use our time here to be filled with your spirit. May we absorb and hear and feel your spirit, not just with our ears, but with our hearts and our minds. We pray, dear Father God, that in the same way that we may be filled with your good spirit and your word, that others may be too. At this time, we especially bring before you the leadership in our church, in our community, in our country, and around the world. We pray, dear Father God, that your word and your goodness and your grace and mercy may reach them all. We pray, dear Father, for the sick, for those who are grieving and those who are in need. At this time, as we prepare to take offering, we pray that this offering may be used to expand and enrich your word in our community and in the world. 
Thank you for all your blessings and your loving kindness and mercy. Amen.
Thank you. A beautiful segue to the beautiful word of the Lord. Please join me, church, in Judges, chapter 2. It's found in page 234 in our Blue Pew Bibles. Judges, chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 6, page 234. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, <clears throat> and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done, <clears throat> excuse me, who knew, ne who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. <clears throat> they, they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt they followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. This is the word of God. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the Belize mission team, uh, 28 of our high school students and adults have uh, made it to Belize. This is actually a picture of them at the airport. They probably look a lot more scruffy now after being there a couple of days. Uh, they're leading a, a children's camp. They're doing work projects uh, to help alleviate poverty. They're ministering in hospitals. And uh, our greatest prayer is just that the beauty of Christ would shine as they serve and that God would shape their hearts uh, as they serve together. So let's pray for them now and let's be praying for them throughout this week. Father, we're so grateful that you call us to your mission, and that mission uh, begins in our own homes or our dorm room, uh, with our families, with our friends. It, it reaches out to our workplaces and to our community and our relationships on the weekends, to, uh, out to our state, to our country, and among the nations. God, would you guide us to be a people who are investing in the next generation, because so much is at stake. I'm so grateful, God, for the emerging generation, uh, some of whom with the Amherst Gospel Choir, we just saw steward their gifts for us. Guide us, God, to be a next generation church, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, before about 20 years ago, when our family moved here from Portland, Oregon, uh, my wife, Carolyn, was an elementary school teacher, and there was a member of uh, the school board named Anna. Uh, we socialize sometimes with Anna and her husband, also named Greg. They're, they're both physicians, and we had a wonderful relationship with them. And I'll never forget over dinner one evening when Anna shared her story with us. Uh, she grew up in a, in a prestigious church, you know, one of those kind of... Uh, uh, rock structure churches that, that were often built a hundred years ago and uh, she, she grew up going to church with her family during her senior year of high school she was voted president of the youth group uh, and then she went off to a prestigious Ivy League school and while she was there in the first two years her faith began to erode and she shared it that it was like at the ocean the waves come and just erode what's around you and then they shared what they describe as the 10 lost years. For the next 10 years, they wrestled with substance abuse, with damaging relationships to, to self-harm. Finally, in a, a, about 10 years later, a, after tremendous pain and wreckage while they were in medical school, they're both physicians, uh, friends of theirs came alongside them and helped bring Christ to life and, and helped answer some of their uh, 
questions that, that were challenging to them and, and, and help bring them home to Christ. And I remember hearing her story and just grieving and just further committing to myself that, that I, I would only be want, to, want to be part of a church or ministry that is passionately and intentionally, and may it be so now and, and ever more so, church, that we might be investing in the emerging generation, that we might be investing so that the emerging generation, rather children growing up here or, or their uh, college students or grad students who come from, from 43 different nations of the world, including the state of Massachusetts, that, that, that they would see who Jesus is lived out in community, that they would have a biblical worldview formed that, that would continue to form for a lifetime so that when challenges or temptations come, instead of eroding, they would have a foundation, they would have a biblical worldview in which to discern all of those challenging questions. Now, they, they'll all then make their own decisions. We can't manufacture that, but at least we will know that we've done everything possible to live out Jesus' followers in community together and that we will send everyone out equipped with a biblical worldview. We've come to the second week of our 2020 Vision Sermon Series. Last week, we front and loaded number one commitment to Christ. And we want to be a church community that is always uh, striving to, to be formed more like Christ. This week, we come to the second of the six themes, generation to generation. Will you join me in Judges chapter 2? We're going to begin in verse 7. I want to speak to you from my heart for the emerging generation, and I want to speak to you from my passionate heart for people who can't speak for themselves. And that's generation not yet born. Because the decisions we make today in our own lives and as a church community together will have impact on generations who aren't even yet born. So Judges chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 7, found in the Blue Bibles on page two hundred. And 34 uh, really gives us a tragic warning and, and a challenge for us to intentionally invest in the next generation, in our homes and together as a church. Uh, join me, Judges 2, verse 7. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and uh, the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done. We need to understand the context. Really, this is God's reflection upon a generation. And what an amazing generation this was. This was the generation whose parents God had brought out of slavery and uh, brought into the wilderness and had revealed God's law to as a reflection of the covenant community God was calling them to be and to live out. So this was their children. They were born in the wilderness. They had been personally taught by Moses. See, Deuteronomy is the second law giving. It's the giving of the law. If you ever want, why, why is the law given both in Exodus and, and, and Deuteronomy? Because they're given for different generations. So they heard personally, Moses teach them the law. They looked with their own eyes at the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. This is a generation that entered the promised land. They crossed the Jordan River in flood season on dry ground. They saw God act in mighty ways. They watched the walls of Jericho crumble. Now, what's amazing is uh, there's a tremendous amount of literature now about Jericho. I, I, I read recently a, an article from the Biblical Archaeology Review. And there is a region where we know Jericho was. Uh, I haven't been into the region, but we've seen uh, the valley and then the hills uh, while we're, we were in uh, Israel. And... What's amazing is uh, city number two of these four ancient cities that were all destroyed, that were all burned out, one of them, uh, archaeologists are, are, are confident, was Jericho, city number two. And there's something about city number two, about no other ancient city that's ever been excavated. The walls of this city fell outward. People don't destroy walls to get out of cities. They destroy walls, right? We set up our siege ramps and, and attack, and, and eventually the walls fall inward. So there was either some kind of a, anomaly uh, 
earthquake, but there's never been recorded an earthquake in that region in that time. Or this was a generation who saw God crumble the city walls in a way that would leave an imprint that we would never forget. That's who this generation is. If there was ever a generation that had a story to tell their children. But let's look what happened. Move down to verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors or to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what the Lord had done for Israel. Now, when we read they had been gathered to their ancestors, that's uh, Hebrew poetry. That's a Hebrewism to say that they died. Isn't that a nice way they were gathered to their ancestors? They died, okay? That entire generation. If any generation knew who God was, had experienced God's power, and had a story to pass to the next generation, it's that generation. But look what happened to the generation, to their children. We read in verse 10, first of all, they didn't know the Lord. Now, I can understand that because every generation makes a choice, right? So please don't, if you're a parent, a grandparent, please don't hear this message as, here's five steps to manufacture to guarantee that your children will follow Christ. If that's true, we would all plug in one, two, three, four, five, and it'd be a formula, and that's not uh, how God calls us to live and nurture. It's much more messy, and it's us living out real faith and intentionally looking for opportunities and creating opportunities to help talk with our children about faith, okay? So this is not meant to evoke guilt. This is meant to evoke inspiration and devotion for us. But, but they didn't know the Lord. I can understand that because everyone makes their choice. But the indictment is what comes next in verse 10. They didn't even know what the Lord had done. They didn't even know the story. What happened? How could this generation who'd seen God act maybe as much as any generation other than their parents and the generation when Jesus walked on earth. Well, why didn't they pass their faith to their children? Were they too busy building their lives and the economy in this new land that God had given to them? Were they acculturated to the values of the peoples who surrounded them and it, and it kind of eroded their faith? Did they go to, to tabernacle worship once a week? And then they figured coming home, all right, we went to tabernacle worship. We're fine, and it didn't connect with the rest of their lives. And their kids saw, you know, there's a disconnect. Faith's not real for my parents. Did they say, you know what, we'll just let our kids choose, choose whatever faith. By the way, that, that may sound good. And I'm not saying to oppress kids trying to make them believe. But when we say, you know, let's just let our kids choose whatever. What we're really communicating is our faith isn't very important. Because... Stuff that is really passionately important to us, right? We're not afraid to tell our kids, hey, kids, avoid drugs. We don't say, hey, you know what? Pfft, do whatever you want because, you know, we don't want to oppress you. No. What we really care about, we do everything that we can to at least live out and communicate faithfully. Maybe they just assumed this is the home of faith. They're going to, they're just going to become religious. What a challenge this is to our homes and to, and to our church community. Because we're called to live genuine faith at home. There's no formula. Let me say this, parents, and, and, and I'm one parent of two um, young adult kids. I know the messiness. I know the challenge. I will confess to you the most challenging place for me to live out my faith is at home. See, it's pretty easy preaching, right? I mean, it's Okay, I mean, it's very hard preaching, okay? But I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? It's scripted. The environment, right? You go to a meeting, it's scripted. You go home and it's unscripted, right? And just, blah, who we are, emerges. Wow. That's the most challenging place. It's so complex. And yet, for us to not be, the most important thing for us is just to love Jesus and let our kids see love and grace and ask them for their forgiveness and be intentional to let them know why we're passionate about our faith. Why it matters more than anything else in the world. And for eternity for us. Because if we don't invest in the next generation, we will lose the emerging generation. A uh, compilation from Barner Research and Gallup Polling and the Pew Charitable Trust uh, estimates that 
in the next generation, so people who are being born right now, that approximately 4% will be Christ followers and actively involved in a church. 4%. Now, I think what this misses is it's more than just demographics, right? There have probably been all kinds of generations who thought Christian faith is being snuffed out. God's sovereign. The church isn't simply an institution. It's an organism. And so I, I, I'm troubled by this, but I'm not panicked. But we need to think about this. See, this is what I want to say. Not on my watch. Not on our watch, amen? We're not going to just stand by and say, well, that's the way that the, st that the statistics are. We together, in helping each other uh, nurture our children, right, through, through the joys and the anguishes, as a church community together, we will do whatever it takes to help to, to nurture your children. Not to delegate it, because... Spiritual formation is primarily a, a parent's responsibility. But partnering with parents will do whatever it takes to help invest in your children. And we'll do whatever it takes together to make decisions today that will impact and be a blessing to generations who are not yet born. Whatever it, it takes. Just a few examples and then we'll look at the, at the impact. Some people ask me, Greg, what, what's... What's your favorite worship style? Come on, you know, we have classic, we, we have contemporary. What do you enjoy the most? And I'll tell you, what I enjoy the most is whatever connects the most people to Jesus. I don't care. It, it, it's all preference. The heart of it, that's not preference. But, but the style of music and liturgy and stuff, I don't care. As long as it's substantive, as long as it honors Christ, whatever helps connect the, the most people to Jesus and to grow in, in Christ To be doing whatever it takes with our time to be mentoring the next generation. To know their names. To be ready to pour into their lives. If it means we need more space in our footprint as a church community, and there's no agenda there because remember, we're still in a messy master planning process, which I honestly don't know where it's going to go. I just know this. Our footprint was built for a church with 70 people. And on Sunday mornings now, we have 550 to 600 people. At some time, whatever it takes, so there's space for the next generation, whatever it takes, financial sacrifices for us to make sure the next generation is nurtured in a biblical worldview to then make an informed choice about what it means to follow Jesus. Amen? That was, that was. Amen? Amen? All right. Here's why. Here's the impact. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. So here, here's the next generation after the promised land. One generation, and we read that they did evil in the eyes of, of, of the Lord. One generation, and there's a clue to why. And I want us to, to probe this and then wrap up with verse 12, but Early in verse 12, do you notice it says that they forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and there's a clause, right, who brought them out of Egypt. That's an important clause. Here's why. Because remember that, that their, that their um, parent, or that their grandparents, you know, their ancestors had been enslaved in Egypt. And then God had told them, take the blood of, of, of of a perfect lamb without blemish, put it over the doorpost, pass over, and God liberated them. God redeemed them out of slavery and brought them to be his covenant people. And that's really our story, right? That, that's a portrait of the gospel, that we were enslaved by our sin and, and our depravity and our brokenness and the perfect lamb without blemish, blood from the cross covers over us, atones for our sin, and we're liberated to be God's people. That's specifically what they didn't communicate. Here's what that means to me. If we ever drift away from the cross of Christ, if we ever fail to be a gospel-centered church, then why would the emerging generation want to bother to show up? Because that's the radical transformation within our hearts from the inside out. 
to come hear the music, man, you can download that anytime. To try to be better people, I don't need the church to make me a better person. I, I can do that Kiwanis, I can do that with a service club, right? Matter of fact, to be honest with you, if I had not radically had a um, experience of the gospel beginning to change me from the inside out, still have a long way to go, then I, I wouldn't be here. I'd be playing golf with my friends. I'd be uh, taking that tithe money and doing a lot of other stuff with it. You know what I'm saying? And that's the next generation, 4%. See, people used to show up to church because it was like the thing to do in the community and it was kind of the right thing to do and it made you a better person. That's gone, right? I pray that we'll never drift away from the gospel and the gospel that Christ loved us and gave his life on the cross and that will be the motivation for us to follow Christ. And really, aren't we rehearsing the gospel over and over and over and over again? Isn't that what our worship is? We're expressing to God our, our love for God for redeeming us out of slavery and calling us to be his people. That's what preaching every Sunday. It's just different ways to come at the same thing, the gospel. Amen? I pray that we'll never stray away from, from embracing that, learning to live that out, and communicating that to the next generation. So look at verse 12. Here's the tragedy. They worship various gods of the peoples around them, so they arouse the Lord's anger. Because they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asherahs. That's a summary, verses 12 and 13, of the next eight generations. The next eight generations. And here's what this is really about. Welcome grapple class, man. We're so glad. This is the grapple fifth and sixth grade class that Cedric leaves. He's going to share his face story in a minute. Welcome. We're, we're glad you're here. Okay, here we go. They're like, who is that? This guy is so strange. Why do they listen to him, right? So, the next eight generations, here's why. Catch this. See, God created our hearts. God shaped our hearts to worship. And we'll either worship God or we'll worship other things. And that's exactly what happened with them. See, there's plenty of American idols that people worship today, right? And, and the popular gods of the generation uh, that we're talking about, of those eight, eight generations were Baal and the Asherahs. And, and I'll just summarize it. There's been a lot of archaeological discoveries at Amarna and Rosh Shamra from that time, 1400 BC. In scripture, 73 times Baal and Asherah are mentioned. When 73 times two false gods, two idols are mentioned, that means that was a problem. That, that was an issue. Two examples, and we'll wrap it up. First of all, in Jeremiah 19, we read this. They built high places to Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal. That was in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, just outside Jerusalem. I've been there. I've looked at the valley of Ben-Hinnom. It's now parks and condominiums, but for years, no Israelite would ever live there. And even Orthodox Jews will not set foot there because that was the place where worshiping Baal, you would take a male child and into the garbage pits. Matter of fact, Jesus uses the word Gehenna, that's the Greek. When he was illustrating hell, he says, beware, because it's like that. And they throw their children into the fire and sacrifice them. The other is Asherah. A man would go into an Asherah temple, and we read in 1 Kings 14 this. They set up high places on every hill. There were shrine prostitutes in the land. Asherah was the god of, of fertility, and I'll leave it there. This is how far the next generation went. Now, if we were to interview that, that generation, the parents and the priests, I'm sure they said, no way would our kids ever go there. But somehow they didn't pass faith, real, genuine, authentic faith. And somehow they missed that redemption that is the core of the gospel. And pass it to the next generation. I pray the church will do whatever it takes in our homes standing together with parents and grandparents and, and, and as a church we will do whatever it takes to equip the next generation to be sent out to nations of the world and any world nation you with a biblical worldview to be 
the influencers for the next generation. Amen. Uh, just, just one of the many, 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 many people. Bob, I love you. What's up? Battery. Have I gone too long? Battery died. <laughs> Battery died. All right. Why well, don't you do it while Cedric shares his faith story? Well, good morning. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, everyone who drinks of this water from the world will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. Everyone has a thirst waiting to be quenched from lust, alcohol, popularity, money, drugs, a whole plethora of ways people are looking to quench their thirst within. I try to meet my thirst through athletics, popularity, and people. I love people. My name is Cedric, and I came to Amherst, recruited to play football for UMass. During this time, I gave in to temptations. Then a devastating knee injury ended my career. When I was alone, I wanted to end my life and say goodbye to this world. I cried out to God at night, why me? Who hasn't said, why me? You know? um, but I was crying, why me? But God worked in this trial to shape my faith in Christ. That began to quench my thirst like never before. I started searching for God, praying. And at the lowest point of my life, I stopped by First Baptist during the week to look for someone to talk to. Pastor Greg greeted me at the doors, and we talked for a while. Greg can talk. <laughs> but I thank you for that. Then I began, I began to attend worship, read books Pastor Greg gave me, go to salt classes, make friends at church. I've learned so much and I've dedicated my life to Christ and was baptized last year. Through the storm, Jesus brought me home to the shore. Now God has given me purpose to serve him by mentoring young people. And this has become my calling. I work in public schools where I invest in children's lives. I lead Kids World Grapple Group with fifth and sixth graders with an awesome team. And we're studying the case of Christ now to help give students reasons to believe, to know that they're not alone. I will also teach a class for the youth in the summer. God has shown me perseverance so I can stand for Jesus Christ and never be thirsty for things that would draw me away from Christ. I'm not perfect. But God still loves me and gives me peace that no human or anything in this world can. Just like the Samaritan woman, God has given her freedom from pain and continuous peace. Jesus has given me a lasting quench. So I will not hide, I will not run, I will walk with Jesus each and every day. Thank you First Baptist Thank you, Pastor Greg. Thank you, Carolyn, 
for leading me home to God, disciplining me to follow Christ, and training me to teach the gospel to children and youth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Who will be the next Cedric? Will either wander through the doors, or who one of our students or a family will reach out to? Who's the next Cedric growing up right now in our church? Who will be reached with the gospel? Who will understand the clarity of the gospel? and who will pour her or himself into the emerging generation. I just want to give us three possible action steps, because it's one thing to be inspired by a message, leave, kind of maybe feel convicted about it, but just three quick action steps. Number one, two books that I would really recommend to you. One is called Sticky Faith, tremendous research from all over the country, just about what, what, what are some of the things that help for the emerging generation for their faith to stick um, when they're launched into college and their adult years. That's a great read for anyone in the whole church because it applies both to homes and to our churches. And the second is uh, 10 Building Blocks for a Solid Family. Um, uh, I really encourage uh, parents, families. This, this just has sage wisdom in an easily kind of readable format. Just be thinking about how to weave intentionality to help share the gospel and to help um, equip our children to follow Christ. Uh, the second of the possible action steps for us in your bulletin is a uh, little brochure. It says uh, Child Children's uh, Ministry or Kids World Volunteers. Uh, <clears throat> did you know that, that if every child who, who comes somewhat regularly among our church community was here, uh, from birth through sixth grade, there'd be 71 kids here. Now, that'll never happen, you know, the same Sunday, but 71 kids. There's exactly 30 people on the Kids World Ministry team, and it takes 14 every Sunday in order to have like four or five people in the nursery with childcare, and for every class to have, you know, the worship, the big group teaching, the small group discussion, everything else like that, and to meet all of our safety guidelines too. But here's a challenge: about half of that team are college students, grad students, and so uh, the real need, a real calling is. Uh, for some of us who are here year-round, especially summer and over the holidays, um, to volunteer. So if that's something that, that you might feel called to learn about, if you sign this, you're not, you're not signing off, off your life. You're, you're deciding to meet together with our uh, Kids World director, uh, Carolyn, uh, just, just to learn more about ways that you might invest in the emerging generation. And then finally, the third thing is, for us to be investing our resources financially. I want to remind us that um, First Baptist, somewhere 45 to 50 percent of our church community are between birth and uh, 23 years old, college students, okay? And here's what that means. So if everyone was here on a Sunday morning, which will never happen, if, every, if everyone was here on a Sunday morning, a little over 800 people would be here, okay? And 550 to 600 during the the, 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 the semester. So we staff for that and we provide resources and space for that, right? But because of so many of the emerging generation who, who we strive to help to learn to be faithful stewards now, because it's a lot harder to start with a $100,000 salary than it is with your work study job or whatever like that now, right? So we want to nurture, uh, nurture that stewardship but most of that's going to be fanned into flames out, out different places. So somewhere around 300, 350 is really kind of our uh, year-round, long-term base. So this is what this means. It means those of us need to be extravagantly generous in order to be able to minister to all of those uh, people, that number of people. And that's a challenge right now. And we can either settle in and we can say, you know what, let's just settle in here. This is good. But show me anywhere where scripture, anywhere Jesus, you know what, settle in right there. That's okay. Just flatline. So we can either do that and pull back resources 
or we can continue to minister to the emerging generation and all generations, and we can break through that with extravagant generosity and intentionally investing ourselves in the next generation. Do you know why a lot of the emerging generation, especially college students, uh, do you know why many of them come to First Baptist? I've asked them often, and of course, you know what I'm expecting. Oh, so, well, the preaching is incredible, right? <laughs> they once in a while mention that. The number one thing that they mention, gray hair, which I don't have yet, by the way, but gray hair, okay? In other words, what they're saying is, I live in this student bubble, that's great, but I love to break out and see the Christian faith lived out by, by families, by people of all kinds of different vocations, different generations. I just, that's so, it's so transforming. To see those of you who are professors, to even see you in worship. Do you know what that does? Do you know what that means for students? And so I just pray that, that we will be a, a generation to generation church, that we'll continue to do whatever it takes to pour into the next generation. Amen? Father, thank you for this kind of unique privilege we have in this Pentecost town where people come from our own community, who come from uh, around the U.S., and who come from all over the world, but more than 40 different nations part of our church community in this Pentecost town who, who come here, many of them in some of the most influential time of their life during their college or grad school. I also thank you, God, for the children and the youth who, who grow up in the midst of of our church community. Father, will you bless the families? Will you give parents a strong hedge of protection around those families, around those marriages? Will you walk alongside families, um, uh, especially, God, those single-family homes of those courageous single parents who are pouring their lives into their children? Father, may we be a generation-to-generation -generation church, helping each other in our homes and being a church community that does whatever it to God. We commit to do whatever it takes. To not just settle here and say, isn't it great to have students? But instead, God, we will fan into flames. And we envision someday, God, that we'll be somewhere in the world and we'll meet people and they'll say, oh, you're from First Baptist. Or it might be in heaven. And they'll say, oh, you were part of First Baptist. I praise God that you equipped people who came to our area and they were ministry ready. And they, and they had lavish generosity. And that impacted our part of the world. This is our prayer. This is our hunger. This is our devotion, we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together and sing out our, our faith. Uh, that it would be something that we express uh, through word, through song, and be passed on from generation to generation.
chosen generation, rise up, holy nation. God, we live for you. And you have called us. church. Amen. Well, let's sing this chorus together. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise, you overcame. disclosure about something that, that, that just uh, maybe helps to speak into just how unique um, our church community in this unique Pentecost town really is, all right? Um, 
a while back, quite a while back, uh, there were a couple churches that contacted us just wondering if we would have conversations with them about serving as lead pastor or, or teaching pastor there, okay? One of them had 12 pastors. They offered us a signing bonus of this huge down payment for a house that we'd never have to pay back. So Carol and I began kind of kind of praying, you know, that kind of caught us off guard, and I began to talk with a couple of, of, of colleagues. And I thought, honestly, that they would say, oh, great, this is a great career movie, I have great influence. Both of them immediately said, why in the world would you do that? I said, great. You're 55, okay? If, you know, let's say you're at First Baptist 12 more years. You're going to have more people than that who are going to come through. You speak every Sunday to people in a mission field of Amherst that so desperately needs the gospel. You speak into this emerging generation that's coming and passing through, and many of them are going to be people of influence because of the education that they're receiving. Why in the world? I'm like, well, yeah. You know. And um, I think God just used that to once again cause us to realize just how unique what's happening, what God's doing. Glory to God. What God is doing here. I pray that we'll just fan that into flames together, amen? Now and in the years to come. To help us with this devotion, uh, Psalm 78 is a, a, a cherished psalm for both Carol and, and me. We've often uh, prayed this over our kids when they were younger. And let's just make this our devotion together. Let's uh, declare this together. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will tell you ancient truths that we have heard from our parents. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord. We will teach children about God's power and wonders he has done. The Lord has commanded parents to teach their children. Then the next generation might know the Lord and put their trust in God. One generation will commend your truths to another. We will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. Praise the Lord. Amen. May that be uh, our devoted heart cry as we go out as the hands, the feet, the voice of Christ in our world. Amen.